Fake accounts, misinformation, fake news, troll farms. Is social media being used to generate a disorienting reality that leaves us all baffled? Is it? <laughs> Hello there, you 5.6 million awakening wonders. Thanks for joining me on this voyage into the light. Together we shall awaken if we learn to discern the truth from the fiction, if we learn to become authentic within ourselves, if we learn to treat one another with respect and dignity, regardless of whether or not we agree with each other on sometimes quite fundamental issues. If you've not subscribed yet, subscribe right now. And remember to comment on this video and give us a thumbs up because it really, really helps us, particularly if you're a real person and not a bot, because today we're talking about troll farms, fake accounts. Did you know that 11% of the accounts commenting on the Johnny Depp Amber Heard trial were fake? Did you know that 19 of the 20 top Christian sites that were commentating on Trump and American cultural issues were traced to bot farms in Eastern Europe? How can we trust reality? How can we trust the opinions we're forming around our culture if we're being bombarded and drugged and intoxicated with fake information and misinformation? Is the real source of misinformation not individual human beings like you and me, but a concerted effort to disorientate us? I spoke to YouTuber Tim Paul about this issue and many others on my podcast, Under the Skin, available from Luminary. In this conversation, we talk about different forms of warfare, how warfare isn't now just military or chemical, but is actually actually psychological, that we're in a war right now. Unless we start to decentralize political power, we're doomed to live in a state of spellbound hypnosis and disorientation. Have a look at this conversation. Please stay to the very end because Tim Paul is illuminating as always. Tim Paul, another one of the brilliant people on YouTube that I don't always agree with. And I'm sure, um, obviously, by default, he doesn't always agree with me. But in conversation, perhaps we can find mutual truths together. Stay to the end and comment and let me know what you think of this conversation. Do you except then that in terms of any kind of political fulfillment and by that i mean the ability to live in a community that's representative of your values and to express yourself as an individual as you want to that you would have to to some degree separate yourself and your community from these centralized structures and if as you seem to be suggesting because you talked about sort of a co-op you sort of at least use that phrase and and, and, and does that indicate that perhaps the future for politics is beyond these centralization models? And I'm, I'm all, are you sympathetic towards people that say, look, what, what difference does it make this theater of, you know, you know of um, this bipartisan theater? Shouldn't we evolve beyond these models that were kind of created hundreds of years ago when representative democracy was more relevant? I, I, I'm worried that we're drifting into hyperpartisanship. You know, I, I think decentralization is always the way to go. There's got to be some central kind of agreement, maybe overarching um, uh, constitution, perhaps that's the way to put it, where we're like, okay, so these are these are the rules we're going to use to engage with each other, but we disagree. So I think that's why the, the U.S. is actually uh, great. The states, the cities, the localities, they each have their own implementation, their own version, but it's, it's, it's hyper-centralizing. And the problem is uh, you can look at it with media. The more we, we lose local media in the United States because they can't sustain themselves in this new attention economy, we see the rise of uh, the New York Times building a massive subscription platform. We see the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal. And then what happens is for the average American, they're hearing about national issues and less local issues. Now, for one, this can breed corruption at a local level, which the local level is where it's at. The federal level is, is often, in my opinion, a distraction for, for a lot of reasons. But then you end up with corruption at the local level you end up with people disassociated from their own communities, and then you end up with hyperpolarization and centralization. So the fear I have with this is, you know, you, you, you take a look at when Joe, Joe Biden came out a few months ago and said that we may need to have more, more lockdowns, more restrictions. This was at a time when Texas and Florida had been releasing their lockdowns. They've been uh, easing the restrictions and mask mandates and all that stuff. And so when Joe Biden comes out and he speaks, saying those things, he's clearly not talking to red states. And so now you, you, you already have a situation where over the past year, many, I think it's like half of Republicans don't view Joe Biden as legitimate and like a third think that he didn't even win the election. And so these people are already feeling like they're not a part of the system. When the president comes out and speaks in a way that very much so speaks to only one side of the country, the centralization is giving way to a, a splitting down the middle of some sort. I don't know ultimately what it would look like, but that's what happens when you go from decentralized communities with a weak central structure where they can communicate to centralizing everything 
and then factionalizing, I think the whole system is going to implode on itself. And I think it's a lot to do with the internet. I think it has a lot to do with uh, social media and the attention economy. I don't know what the solutions are, to be honest. You know, people have a right to free speech. You used to like say more, um, thank you, Laura. You used to say more um, frequently, at least as, as, as far as I'm aware, that you felt that, I think, I guess in the final days of Trump, that America was on the brink of some kind of civil war. Um, I still do. Do you? Yeah, there's a, uh, uh, but there, there's been polling data that I think may, uh, uh, you know, evolve that opinion. Notably, there was a YouGov data that showed, I think it was YouGov, that uh, there's five regions in the United States. There's the Northeastern, there's the Southern, there's the Heartland, there's the, the West and the mountain regions. And in each region, there was a large plurality of people who wanted to secede from the union and form their own regional governments, essentially. If you, if you uh, normalize for population in each, by each state, I did the math, you end up with 37.2% of the US population wanting the country to break apart. Yeah. That's, that's, that's massive uh, because opposition to a, a, a balkanization of the United States is comparable. It's in, the, it's in the third range. So you have about a third of people who are like, I don't care. You have about a, a little bit over a third saying, shut her down. And you have about a third saying, no, no, keep it as it is. And so when it comes to the yes or no vote, the people who abstain, abstain, and then you'll get what, 50-50? So I, I don't exactly know what it would look like though. I think people have this uh, um, misconception about what civil war really means. Uh, and they also don't take into account that we're in what's referred to as fourth and fifth generational era of warfare. Uh, we don't necessarily use kinetic force to win wars. We use uh, psychological operations, propaganda, manipulation. And so uh, depending on how you want to define it, look, we had a guy get shot in the chest by an anti-fascist after a Trump rally in Portland. We just had a shootout in Portland just a couple of days ago. It may, the, the kinetic aspect of any kind of civil conflict may keep itself constrained to these left and right skirmishes in various cities. Then it, it simmered down a little bit. We're in kind of a low year because politics, uh, you know, we, we just got off a presidential election. But I mean, you look now with the uh, cyber symposium and uh, I see a cat yeah. and, uh, yeah. and uh, we, we, have, we have the audits in Arizona. You know, I, I just talked with Steve Bannon the other day and he's talking about audits in, in, in Georgia and Wisconsin and Michigan and all these states. This is persistent. These people aren't backing down. They don't view Biden as the real president. And so if, if you have that rising sentiment, I'm not saying that we're going to see, uh, you know, one thing Bill Maher said was that there couldn't be a civil war because the Mason-Dixon line would go through grandma's kitchen, in a reference to the line that divided the North, North and the South. But I think that's, uh, Americans have this, this issue where we view, we view conflict or, or uh, circumstances or uh, concepts through an American lens. They don't seem to understand that the world exists and the Spanish Civil War, for instance, the Russian Revolution, you take a look at what happened in the US with state versus state, North versus South, and it's very unique to the United States based on its structure, this massive union of different jurisdictions. But you take a look at the Spanish Civil War and you can see pockets erupting of different factions declaring different regions. So again, when, uh, uh, when I say Civil War, it's, I, I don't know, you know, I, I've tried to, to, to veer away a little bit from saying Civil War simply because I think people don't understand it. They, they assume I'm saying that California is going to declare war on Texas or something, which I, I don't mean that. But you could see different factions popping up. Ultimately, you could see factions forming allegiances or alliances with each other. Mm. And, you know, ultimately, I think when people are already ready to kill each other, are already wishing for the death of each other on social media, I, I think we're, we're, we're going to go into a psychological conflict. That's, that's what uh, uh, fifth generational warfare is a reference to manipulating someone online through using fake accounts to convince them that a certain idea is popular. Uh, fourth generational warfare is more uh, is, is similar, but does involve physical conflict and things like that, propaganda, black ops, false flags, et cetera. I'm looking at Twitter, man, and I'm seeing people celebrate death, wish for death, o overtly, these are verified blue check mark, high profile accounts, gloating and wishing for death. And that, that's you know, been escalating. So I'll, I'll put it this way, I'll put it in simple terms. In 2018, we saw Proud Boys, Antifa, right wing, left wing groups clashing. And it was some of the most violent conflict I'd ever seen you know, in the US. I'm not, I'm not that old, I'm 35, but I had been at Occupy Wall Street. I had seen you know, anarchist Antifa and stuff like that. I saw people throwing M80s at old women. I, I saw improvised explosive devices. I wouldn't rate as too dangerous, but dangerous. 
uh, mortar shells being thrown. This was 2018. And so I was, I was, that, that's when I started saying, if, if this continues to escalate, because we've already seen the culture war bubbling up since Gamergate in 2013, if this continues, we're at the level of kinetic uh, skirmishes, you know, physical violence, then I, I don't see why people will back down when they're being threatened this way and the police aren't intervening. They're going to get angrier. They're going to spread more media. They're going to challenge each other more so, and the violence will continue to escalate. So I, I've had a few people challenge me on the notion saying that I was completely wrong to imply that there could ever be a civil war in the United States. And this is back, you know, 2018, 2019, 2020. First, I'll say that um, I first bring this up because there was an article, I believe it was in The Atlantic, where they said that they polled a dozen or so or a large number of national security experts who said that they felt the second civil war in the United States was probable, ranging from some estimates of 30 percent, some saying 90 percent. You know, I see an article like that, and then I, I, I take that uh, expert opinion, apply it to my own experiences, and come to an agreement. I think that conversation with Tim Paul shows just how advanced psychological warfare is and just how terrifying a spectacle it could become. Let me know what you thought of the conversation in the comments below. Remember to subscribe to my channel. Only 60% of you do. I'd love it if you all subscribe. Remember to give us a thumbs up if you feel so inclined. If you enjoyed this video, watch either one of these two or both of them. They're both fantastic videos. Please subscribe to my mailing list. I give you a weekly bulletin. I tell you all the live stuff that I'm up to. I'm always doing live things online and in physical reality too. It's really important important that you sign up today in case I'm ever not on this platform. More important than any of that though is that you please stay free.